Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, so yes, so consciousness is today's topic. Uh, when I first started uh, preparing for this talk, I was the one one question that that really bothered me was why why do we need to talk about consciousness here uh, if we're interested in culture? Uh, in a sense, you don't. I I have often get into these issues in my classes. So many people think of consciousness as a fairly high level social phenomena. There was a phrase social awareness, you know, social consciousness. We are not really going to talk about that so much today for the reason that um, that kind of problems have, are interesting. They have exercised the imaginations of, of many scholars, but they, but they haven't really get to the core uh, of, the, of the interest in, in the research field largely because of this one very simple point that if you get it, you'll get the, basically the whole rest of the talk. Is that when people talk about consciousness, uh, quite often they are talking about a, a lot of information processed very deeply and powerfully and complex and et cetera. They talk about a very strong signal in the, in the, in the head. That's when you're conscious. And when they talk about unconscious, they talk about a very feeble little bit of a signal that gets processed in a very shallow, uh, superficial, uh, unimportant way in the brain. That, that's what they meant quite often when they say, so if you even if you take a vision scientist, they would say, oh, this is like a visually processed uh, uh, stimuli uh, versus some other uh, uh, a visually masked, unconscious stimuli. What they really mean is some stimuli get processed very effectively in the brain, and some are just very feeble and didn't really get very far. And in that sense, yeah, of course, then 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 it's not that profound. I mean, when and, and likewise, you can say our social consciousness, our social consciousness for environmental issues. What they meant was it used to be the case that not many people talk about it. Now everyone knows about it. Yeah. So it, it's often something like very big, very widespread very global, very stable, very complex, which is something very small, very trivial, very, very local. That, 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 that's that. You, you, you can talk about the dynamics and the mechanism. Uh, but that isn't quite how uh, many of us got so crazy and <laughs> decided to spend 20 years of your life doing, doing this problem. The, the issue really comes from something that is somewhat has a more metaphysical flavor the idea is, well, we, we, I study brains for a living, uh, and, 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 and brains are, are, are difficult, right? You, you know, a, as you've seen from some other talks, brains are very difficult stuff. But one of the most useful approach uh, that has uh, dominated the, 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 the whole landscape for, for about a half century, it, it's called cognitive science, right? It's cognitive neuroscience. We bring analogies from computers uh, to, to try to understand the brain. The brain is a basically a biologically instantiated uh, information processing machine. It's a, it's a, it's a meat-based computer. Uh, not, not meat per se, but you know, you know what I mean. And, uh, and, and so neurons are like logic gates, and not exactly, but they're analogies to that. And then you have channels, you have signal, you have signal to noise ratio. You, you try to bring these uh, terminologies from, in the earlier days, mostly electrical engineering, and now to, to computer science to try to make analogies to, to think about how, how this works. A bit like why well, if, if you understand the heart, you, think, you, you want to think about hydraulics. What is a pump? So how does pump work? Pump have valves waff, and all this stuff. So you understand pumps and you can build pumps and maybe you can understand hearts. Uh, a bit, bit of a similar analogy. And that approach has worked wonderfully. Right? So before that, we had psychology had a, had a history that, that is not always, doesn't always give us a lot of pride. We, had, we have a lot of psychological approaches that don't, didn't work very well. And this kind of cognitive approach has worked relatively well. Uh, but there is one thing that kind of sticks out like a sore thumb, and that's consciousness. Because computers don't, don't feel anything, right? You build a computer, and, and you understand it from the, from the hardware level to the software level. You wrote the whole program. And where in any line of your code that says that the computer should feel qualitatively something? Well, you can build in something like emotion. I can talk about feelings in that sense. Emotion would be a kind of slow uh, reaction that is somewhat inflexible to some other objects. I'm not talking about those. I'm talking about simple, simple uh, uh, sensations. Like, like when you see red, red looks a certain way. Right? Red is not just picking up some wavelength from, your, from, from the light rays that enters your retina. And you analyze, okay, there's a number, and you match it to red. This is how your computer would do it. 
Uh, and if that were true, then swapping red and green would not have much problem, right? You can just swap red and green, and then you just swap the, the language output functions. So the computer would just say, oh, this is uh, red, because actually it would register green, but it doesn't, wouldn't make any difference, right? But in, 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 in people like us, it makes a difference. Red looks red. It's not just that you identify, you can point to it as red and, 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 and talk to the people. Internally, introspectively, it feels red. And that seems to be just like not even clear how do you do this in, as a science. I mean, because essentially in science, you try to relate some object, objectively measurable variables to some other objectively measurable variables and build models about these objective facts. Uh, and, and, and then you, you account for one set of objective facts via some other objective facts that you call mechanisms or whatever. Uh, but here you have something subjective that essentially is about the person and, and it's not up to you. You can't just open someone's head and say like, well, this person uh, has no headache. And, but the person says, no, I'm, but I'm in pain. It's like, well, but this is you. Uh, I look at your brain, your brain seems fine, you have no headache. It, it's not going to work. Uh, ultimately, there is a subjective authority, and, and that subjective authority is not just a matter of knowing. It's not that he knows something you don't know. To some extent, yes, but it's a bit more than that. The, 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 the fact that the agent knows something is known qualitatively, subjectively, phenomenologically, and that is a hard problem. And in fact, that's been called a hard problem. Uh, so I entered the, 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 the field uh, after reading a book that that's called a hard problem book. Uh, it's, it's actually called The Conscious Mind by, by Dave Chalmers. And, and it was written in the 90s. I read it as a late teenager um, and, and went crazy. And, and every, a lot of people did. It's not just me. So I, when I said I went crazy, I said it almost with some, some endearing pride. <laughs> like the, a, a whole group of us. Uh, that, that really revived the interest of the field. I mean, of course, only later on, you realize that the history often get revised. So that is something that I think uh, is one, point number one I'm going to tell you. So the topic I roughly introduced, this is what we're going to talk about. You might think, ah, oh, this is really cool, but how does it relate to culture and, and other stuff? Well, it relates in, um, I think, a number of ways. Uh, and one way might be not what you thought about. is is the history of a field that has such a difficult past. So in some way, I think we share some interest here. Uh, so the field of consciousness came from this kind of very, very, some, some sort of philosophical, metaphysical, uh, indulgent background. And throughout grad school, I always remember uh, these conversations with, with first my advisor and then every other professors in the, in the department who would now and then pull me aside. Like, Are you sure you really want to do this? Like this doesn't sound like that you're going to have much of a, a very easy career because the problem is great. It's so, it's so challenging and fascinating. But, but people who have spent centuries in, on this problem, uh, people apparently much smarter than you with Nobel Prizes and whatnot, have tried these problems. And, and it really doesn't work because it doesn't look like how you can address it scientifically. Um, and of course, being young and, and, and stupid, I was exactly motivated by that, that the feeling of you know, going against the grain. Um, and, and I thought that was cool. Even though this, this is called the hard problem, this is the biggest challenge. Maybe other people who are smart didn't do it, but I will be the one who solved this problem. This is exactly the kind of overambitious young graduate student's uh, kind of thinking. But I think there's an also interesting part, which is the, the sociology of it, that, that you come from a field where many people think that you're not going to succeed very well. Uh, you don't have a whole lot of data because the field is not very, is not very well established. And how do you try to establish that? So that has been a, one of the lessons I've learned in my, in my short career. Um, how do you convince your colleagues that you, sh you know, the national funding agencies that funds the most rigorous biomedical research should fund this research? Uh, given the historical baggage. Uh, and when I talk about historical baggage, I should also mention there was also Freud, right? So Freud is a great writer, uh, lots of insights, uh, except that many people would argue that he did more harm than good to the field. And, and often when I said that, you get people would say, well, why, how can you do that? Well, that is, again, that, that relates to the, the topic. Is there's a sociology of science that matters. Every time I try to talk about it, people would say, well, let's stick to the science. Let's, let's just talk about the ideas. No, you can't. I mean, if you, really, if you really think you can, you probably 
are not a scientist or you don't really understand scientists or you only think you're a scientist. Uh, it's, it's like, let's just do experiments and don't interpret them. It, no, it's part of the game. Uh, not just part of the game, it's part of the, the very nature of the exercise of science. And the sociology matters, right? So the, just the social perception of your field matters a lot because it just not, they matter to you, they matter to your students too, right? So either if you don't have job security, you better worry about this. If you do, you better worry about the others who don't. And if your field doesn't grow, if your field doesn't attract funding, you also are not gonna win anything, right? So many, many great ideas from the armchairs turn out to be utterly embarrassing. Um, Linus Pauling, one of the example I, I like to make is, uh, is, some of you might know him, he has two Nobel Prizes. And at some point, towards the late, late part of his career, he, he thought that you know, eating vitamin C would cure cancer. Yeah. So I won two Nobel Prizes. You can, anyone can, can, can make really, really wrong claims. And it's not that because the idea was stupid. It was just that the empirical evidence doesn't always fall in your favor. And how do you guarantee that? You need experiments. You need replications. You need other labs to replicate you. So science never exists in this vacuum. You always have to think about the sociological aspects of it. And in that sense, Freud has done major damage, right? Because it gave a lot of bad reputation and as if the field is not empirical enough. The ideas might be great, but some of them turn out not to be wrong. You're not even wrong, some of them. And it really, according to like Heinz Einstein, literally, and I sometimes agree, it set the field backwards for about half a century. And these kind of things can happen, uh, and I think Consciousness is a very interesting topic in that sense, if you're interested in that sort of stuff, which you should. If you're not interested, you should, you should get your copies of Thomas, Thomas Kuhn and start reading. Uh, especially here, I feel that there's a sense that we are, we're starting a revolution, right? You're trying to combine a, a traditionally uh, 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 very different approach into neuroscience or, or taking neuroscience to a different level. You're really talking about some sort of paradigm shift. And all these terms come from Thomas Kuhn, uh, the philosopher. You should really read it. He's a physicist turned philosopher, so he's not like just someone who talked about it from the outside. And if you're interested in that sort of stuff, consciousness is a fascinating topic in its own right for the sociological aspects. We are in a like extremely, I think it's historically, uh, it's a case study that is worth studying in its own right. If any of you want to become a historian and, and philosopher of, of, of uh, science, I highly recommend you to try to uh, come and be a, do, some, do some ethnographic work on this. So, okay, that's enough of uh, just hand-waving, telling you roughly where we stand. So, um, so the problem has been, as I said, is about consciousness, about how, how subjective experience come about. So in grad school, um, that was talked about almost like nearly two decades ago, uh, I, I, following an, a, a movement that is called the Neural Correlate of Consciousness Project. Uh, so we, we basically the idea is that, well, it's so difficult, right? You have to explain something subjective can come out. Maybe one thing is we start with just collecting some data. That's like often how science works. You just you have no idea how a problem is. You just sit down in an armchair, and many people have written many things, and they just don't. Some of them doesn't, didn't make any sense. And so one thing you can do is just identify some variables that you can actually map out and do an honest, simple uh, empirical project. And the idea is that you have some processes in your brain that, that are qualitative, subjective, that, that when you stimulate those brain tissues, people, people say that they experience stuff. Uh, a lot of it was done by, 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 by uh, Dr. Penfield. Uh, um, this, this street is named after him, um, and he stimulated them in cortex during surgery, and people say, oh, I see, so, I see stuff, or I feel being touched, or, or my hand moves, etc. And then there are also brain tissues that don't quite work like that, right? Um, they, they, well, they are brain, they're, they're neural firing, they're, they're, they are uh, processes that we know they, they actually do stuff informationally, but they, you, you don't feel anything, you, don't, you, you can't talk about them, you don't know why. Um, and, and you can compare them. Uh, so that's called the neural correlate consciousness. You're not trying to solve why the two pieces of tissues are so different qualitatively in terms of your subjective experience, but try to map them out anyway, and then, and then collect some information about the physiology and anatomical nature. Maybe we'll tell you something, and, and then we'll see from there. And that actually, that attitude I went up turn out to be a very useful one, really. That's really how most of science is done. Um, and so I'm going to cut the long story short. Essentially, we have a favored a type of model. So you can think of it uh, as a signal coming to your brain. 
Uh, this is an abstraction of a cartoon, uh, but we can actually write it down in computational models and, 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 and think about it too. You can think, well, so maybe you have some signal in the brain that goes into some sort of process here, and then it gives you this subjective sensation and also gives you the objective uh, processes. You can think of it like that. Uh, you can also have uh, different parts of the brain. Maybe some parts are conscious, some parts are not conscious. So maybe the conscious and unconscious are the same part, but they have different levels or they may pass different criteria or something. That's the first model. The second model would be you have uh, diff the different signal goes to different parts of the brain. So this part of the brain would be conscious. This part, which is like that part is not. And we'll figure out why later. And there's a, also another kind of uh, model which I favor. It's called a hierarchical model. It sort of connects to, in philosophy, what we call higher order theories, is that you have some early stage of processes that are not really conscious. And then when it reach a later stage, uh, or get monitored by a later stage, they become conscious. And here's just one example of an experiment how we uh, come to these kind of uh, idea is that you can uh, set up uh, a task. Let's take a task, it's very simple. You present them a simple shape. I think here is a square or a diamond. And people will press keys and say whether they, they saw it or not. And as you do these experiments at near threshold, which is the, the, the art of psychophysics, you just titrate the stimulus so it's not so easy to see and not so hard to see. Uh, exactly in between, then they would perform at like 70% correct. So chance is 50 because it's a two choice. So they're like not exactly as bad as chance and not at ceiling either. Uh, if they do it that way, then you, uh, they, then they sometimes see the stuff and sometimes don't see the stuff. And then you can also play tricks because when you do psychophysics, you measure everything really well, like luminance, contrast, and all this stuff. And then you can actually play with the stimulus in, in, in some subtle ways so that in one condition, subjectively, they would say that they see the stuff more clearly in this condition. And in the other condition, they say they subjectively don't see very clearly. OK, so you can see that this difference is small, it's significant, but it's like a 10% difference. Uh, so this is not a huge effect. Uh, we can get to bigger effects later. Uh, there are other ways you can get this. Uh, so for instance, you can also uh, take a knife and cut people's visual cortex, uh, which you don't do. <laughs> but uh, you don't damage people's visual cortex, but sometimes people's visual cortex get damaged. And if it's damage is it, localized to the primary uh, visual cortex, the striate cortex, sometimes a phenomenon called blindsight happens. And in that case, it's basically an exaggerated version of this. Uh, in the affective visual field, they would say completely have no idea what's going on. Uh, in fact, I, I interviewed one blindside patient, and I thought I was smart. I, I, I asked him to like, you know, write down the phenomenology, try to describe it in more, more, more detail. And the guy just laughed at me and said, like, can you describe what it's like to look through the back of your head? Like, there's nothing. There's nothing to talk about. I was hoping he would say, like, it's, it's kind of dark and <laughs> it's impoverished. I was hoping he would give me some words that I can, I can use. It's like, no, there's no words to describe something that you don't see. So it's like completely blind in the half of the visual field and then, and, and then basically sighted in the, in the other visual field. So you can present stimuli to each of the, the hemisphere, uh, hemisphere field and then, and then titrate them. Again, the, the, the amazing thing is the blind field turns out he can do these tasks. He can identify whether there's one shape or the other by guessing but he would guess like 80% correct. So you can match the performance of, of accuracy, roughly controlling, so there's about, about, about the same amount of signal in both. Uh, so you're not just like match, comparing big stuff, big signal versus small signal. Uh, and when you compare them, uh, you can actually, you tend, in, in those studies as well we've done, you, you, you consistently find these like activations in prefrontal cortex measured using fMRI, using just like very crude methods of, of, of blood dynamics, uh, blood hemodynamics. And that, but, but, but that gave me some idea that, oh, this may fit, kind of fit with this kind of model, right? So it looks like consciousness is something that is about how the signal impact on these higher cognitive areas where you uh, hold your working memory, direct your attention, and form beliefs about the world. And the beliefs is really what I, really ultimately thing is what, what, what is most likely going on. Because I cannot think of a situation when I say I consciously see something, uh, but it doesn't actually change what I believe. I mean, seeing is not exactly believing. Seeing has a high tendency to change a belief. Sometimes I see stuff that I don't really believe, right? You know it's an illusion. Or, you, or I heard people sometimes voluntarily ingest hallucinogens for fun. In those cases, they probably just are having fun and they, they do not believe what they are seeing if they're hallucinating and they know it. But even in those cases, there's a tendency for you to drive you into believing what you see. And sometimes seeing is not just there. Um, it forms the logical basis for your beliefs. 
it's like it's almost like reasonable. I see like that there's a there's a bottle here, and 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 if you ask me, oh, how are you sure? Well, I'm 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 seeing it right now. That seems to be a very reasonable answer. So that it impacts on your high level cognition. That basically I think is a not a very profound finding, but I think we are moving forward. Um, and I can spend the next half hour or so tell you how we are refining this idea. We are putting electrodes in, in, in these uh, areas in patients, uh, also sometimes uh, uh, invasively in, in smaller animals. Um, we're doing more computational modeling, refining these. We do tons of experiments on, on this sort of stuff. Some that don't work so well, some work better. But I'm not going to tell you the story. In fact, to, to fit to the theme as I introduce, I'm going to tell you the sociology of it and why I basically I'm stopping doing this kind of work. I think we hit a, a roadblock there. We're not getting anywhere. And, and turn out the problem is not just because, so people, I, when I started, I thought, when you get to this point, then you, you will meet the hard problem, right? You have to explain consciousness. That's really hard. Turn out the really hard problem is not that. The hard problem is always about people. You're in science. You do science with other scientists, and that's a problem. So I told you that in, in the 90s, uh, books are written about, about uh, uh, these kind of problems. And mostly, they related this to physics. So there's a, there's a line of history that I think is heavily revised, heavily revisionist, that says that uh, uh, modern studies of consciousness started in the 90s. It's just not true. Uh, I think they get away with it because before the 90s, there was no internet. So the people who are used to you know, searching for your papers online in, in your whatever search engine, you don't read those older papers, do you? I mean, I, I, I must say, I confess, I, I, I have a much harder time convincing myself to get myself to the library and, and request a copy and make Xerox. You see, you know, some of you don't even know what Xerox are. Uh, you, you make these, these copies, and then you download, and you scan them in PDF, and then read them on my tablet. <laughs> and I just, <laughs> just forgot, oh, actually, I could have just read the physical paper. But people don't do those anymore. So a lot of the literature from the 80s and, and 70s were forgotten. In fact, I just described the phenomenon blind sight. It was not way before the 90s, like 80s, 70s, some classic Libet studies in the 80s, 70s. Uh, but people say that in the 90s, everything happened. What they meant was this. What they meant was the field was small. All the, it's still small, actually. It hasn't really got much bigger. Um, because doing this kind of work seems so hard, and you're doing a research program that doesn't have a clear objective of what you're trying to solve, uh, which actually is not that big of a problem. You think about memory research. People wouldn't say, I want to solve memory. But people always have this feeling that they have to solve consciousness. Uh, it's a bit of a legacy thing. There's a hard problem there, and a bunch of really smart people try to race towards solving this problem. There's always been this culture. In the 90s, that was really brought to the forefront. Uh, a couple of Nobel Prize winners, namely Francis Crick, discovered, you know, code discover uh, or jointly discover. First, I think Rose, Rosalind uh, Franklin uh, provided the data. And then with, with Watson, they, they wrote a paper and, and claimed to have uh, uh, invented the, the, the double helix structure. Got a Nobel Prize. Jared Edelman, you know, uh, also in physiology and medicine. And uh, Roger Penrose, who's didn't ha who doesn't have a Nobel Prize, but basically have the equivalent uh, in, in physics, a Wolf Medal with a um, Wolf Prize uh, with Stephen Hawkins. So these are the really serious giants in the field. And then they get it together in the 90s. And then they really try to declare, now it's time to really attack this problem. And actually, even back then, I think many psychologists and neuroscientists did not exactly know what was going on. Uh, it's like, wh wh why are we suddenly doing this like, like it's a new thing? Because we have been doing this, these studies. It's just that the field is small. We don't have a lot of funding. Uh, but then they went along for the ride. I think it's a good thing, right, to have heavy hitters in, in joining a field, making really, really uh, high, po high, high profile claims and making it all the media. What really changes, I think those guys uh, call up nature and science editors and said, like, look, we have no data, but I have Nobel Prize. You should let me publish this opinion piece in your journal. And guess what happens when you do that? They always say yes. <laughs> yeah. Editors, I mean, uh, nothing against them or for them uh, in support. But having worked in the industry for a long time, you know how editors work. If you're famous, you can, you can, you can publish anything. Uh, yeah, if, if you're well known, if you're very well established, the quality of the, site, the, the, of the article often is virtually irrelevant. Uh, <laughs> so it's not to say those papers are bad, but those papers, frankly, also objectively speaking, had no, had no data. Uh, and, and then we then wrote a lot of theoretical pieces. There were still the good days. Uh, I think people didn't realize how 
what kind of problem we've gotten ourselves into. Uh, I was in, I was attracted into that field in in that in that from that kind of activities from this kind of publicity uh, issues. So at some point, it becomes a celebrity show. You go to these consciousness conferences, you see more Nobel Prize winners and and and, and famous people. It's almost like celebrity sighting. For for a graduate student, it was a real treat. I mean, I, I went I started went to those conferences in the early 2000s. It was a real treat. You suddenly go you you, you feel they're joining some VIP club, and they're very welcoming because nobody had data, right? So you're you're the first generation of graduate students who might be collecting data. Yeah, we like you. So you're joining a club of uh, a club that has a very high intelligence, average presumably, but also very high ego. Many of them think that they are going to be the ones solving these problems, uh, which makes it very di the culture is very different from any other field. People just feel they want to do work. You know, if you go to Alzheimer's, I think very few people will say, "I will solve Alzheimer's." It's like we'll, we'll understand it better and hopefully create some novel treatments that may or may not work. We'll find out in 10 years after some trials. People would be like that, right? But in consciousness, everybody thinks they are going to be the, the one. Um, and so, the, so, the, so the, the, in, what, a, what a concept we can call an intelligence to ego ratio may not be particularly high. The intelligence is very high. Uh, and likewise, the, uh, the data to theory ratio is, is just abysmal. Everybody has a theory. Uh, you have more, you have more, no more number of theories and number of authors. Uh, at the same time, you don't have a lot of data. It created a culture where people can say anything, and and they can also say it. They know that the the the, the media start to like them because the media floodgate opened. So everyone, a lot of people are competing more for the media mandate and competing, and and that is compounded with the fact that we we don't have a lot of mainstream funding from there. Uh, we still don't, and some people, I think, actively also try to continue to say, oh, we're not going to get those funding. Let's get private funding. But given this situation, you think about where the private funding goes. The private funding goes to those guys who are in the very close circles of the, uh, of the celebrity club. So it, I think it really becomes a problem that came to a head in the past few years, and we only now know it. Uh, I didn't know it. I thought it was great. I thought it was a great feel of such you know, high profile, and I, I benefited from it. I published papers that I frankly don't think are that good, but they're in good journals because the topic was, was hot. Um, and, and the journals, editors like us. But I think our substance is lacking. Um, so that's been a problem. I, I'm going to give you a specific example. This is going to be tricky. I'm going to use specific example from people I know. Uh, they are my you know, friendly opponents. These people wrote my reference letter there. I, I like them. I know them well enough to know that they will not take offense, so I can point out. But it's just a small tip of the iceberg. It's, the whole field has a structural problem. So these people are uh, Professor Christoph Koch. Uh, these are very well-known, established scientists uh, in the field and outside the field, too. So I feel that they can, they can take a little bit of, of heat here without, without much problem. There are others who are basically charlatans and would do the same kind of thing uh, all the time. So um, it's, it relates to the story I've been telling you, right? I mean, it's a parallel plot, unfortunately. Um, so I was saying that the like, prefrontal cortex seems to be important for consciousness. And they have been criticizing me for, uh, for a point that I think is fair, that they say, like, with the Venetian prefrontal cortex, do people go blind, right? Your, your studies about visual consciousness, the Venetian prefrontal cortex, they don't go blind. This is a relatively fair point. Uh, I'll address it next. Um, but the, to, to make one interesting comment, Christoph Koch himself used to be on the other side of the debate. He used to think PFC is the holy grail of consciousness. And when people made this argument to him, he, he ignored them. So now that he's turned to the other side for some reason, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll get to why in a bit, maybe. Uh, and, and, and he now criticized me for not handling these uh, lesion cases as well. I, we, we, we'll get to that. Uh, and, but he also said something like, uh, you know, subjective and objective measures. So subjective measures meaning you just ask them whether they saw the thing. Objective measure, as in the cases, you just see, you, you make them, you, you measure their ability to discriminate these targets, right? Uh, these two measures are basically the same thing. They should be in concordance with each other if they apply judiciously. They wrote in a high-profile paper, Nature Reviews Neuroscience, 2016. Um, so I was, a, you know, at least a little bit taken aback because if you do a one, one step of logistic reasoning, they are basically saying that I'm not judicious because I just found this, right? So this is where subjective and objective measures empirically dissociate. But they say, no, they shouldn't if you are really doing it right. Uh, 
okay, that's a little bit of a slingshot argument that, 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 that doesn't really say much. But if you just run through the, to the end of it, I also mentioned, right, the, the, the phenomena I did are supported also in other extreme cases, such as blindsight. So by writing this, you're also writing off the phenomenon of blindsight, which is in textbooks. You're also writing off not just that. Actually, you know the case of DF, you know, your Canadian hero, and my, and my good friend and mentor, uh, Mel Goodale. So Mel Goodale's work is about the dorsal and ventral stream dissociation and the famous patient DF, DF can uh, actually put a, a card into a slot. So you have objective measure, you can ability to task, but DF could not tell you what the orientation was. Subjective was missing. And again, that's like bread and butter, class book standard. I mean, you, you find a, if you find a textbook of neuropsychology that, that does not have that case in it, you better should not be using that textbook. Uh, and, and these are really classic stuff. So basically writing off the whole industry of neuropsychology. Like, all these people are not judicious. It should not, doesn't make sense. Um, and, and then you also have cases where uh, they would say all psychophysics are irrelevant because psychophysics study things that are that kind of near threshold. Uh, you're either kind of between seeing and not seeing. Really, you want cases where you clearly see or clearly don't see. Uh, the argument, I guess, superficially sounds right, but if you really think about what they mean, they mean that all the psychophysics that's been done since the date of Fatner uh, to Norma Graham, David Marr, Green and Sweat, uh, S.S. Stevens, all of those are irrelevant to consciousness. Writing off entire brain. Again, if you study perception, psychology, psychophysics, and signal detection is like your, yeah, again, your, your, your 101 material. It's like all of these, like, no. You can throw them out of window. Uh, and and they, the last one is a little bit of unfair, uh, to, but it's a paraphrase. But you can actually find something very close to what they say, again, in very high profile places, in print, in videos. They say basically our theory is the best because it's the most promising. Uh, it's really, there's not much to, to this kind of claim. You can find it mostly from Christophe, maybe less from Julio. Uh, and again, I, I know and like these people, that's why I can say it. I hope that they would not kill me afterwards. But this is just really the culture, just to give you a snippet of, there are other people I'm not so comfortable quoting, you know. Uh, and this is really kind of how things work. Uh, if you have the media mandate, and Christoph say these things in Nature, Ameri Scientific American. If you really have the media mandate, you can say whatever. Yeah, it doesn't, the details don't matter. You can, if, if, if some evidence from a whole branch of science are against your views, and even though you once thought those evidence are good, you cited those in your favor, you can now just write it off. So now that whole branch is just not very good. I'm not gonna, I'm just gonna ignore them. Uh, and that has become kind of how it works. So that sounds a little bit like close to at hominem. Uh, I don't want to do that. So this is a, this is a more clear case of an uh, actual case uh, what happened. So, so they, yeah, they say PFC lesion uh, doesn't cause blindness. And I think if you go to a textbook, you find the same thing. PFC lesion do not, do not abolish subjective awareness. Um, but I think here it's not clear what they meant for two reasons. One is I, I, we don't say that lesioning PFC would make you blind. We said that PFC in some specific areas of PFC uh, uh, is not for vision, but it's for subjective introspection of vision, right? It's, a, it's, your, it's your conscious experience. It's part, of your, it's, part, it's part of the substrate supporting your conscious experience. So if you lesion the area, you may not go blind. Uh, in fact, we expect you not to go blind, but we expect, expect you to have something like blindsight. Right. You should have the ability to do tasks, you might perform well, but if I ask you to reflect on your experience, you might have some trouble doing that. And are those tasks being done? Uh, actually, they have, but we, we haven't gone to that yet. So mostly they're not talking about those yet. And the other issue is that the prefrontal cortex, we, uh, it, again, is very well known in textbooks that you have, you have, you have two. Uh, you, have two <laughs> you have two hemispheres, and, and they are densely connected, and they work together. And also, you have parietal counterparts. So they are like, you have four CPUs, if you like, for, uh, for, this, um, for this circuit. And very careful experiments have been done uh, in my colleague, like Bob Knight's uh, lab, showing that if you remove one of the CPUs, the other three takes over. It's, it's, it's a well-known property called redundancy. Right? If you, likewise, you can think about I have two hands, uh, so my, my, I'm using my, my right hand to, to drink water right now. Uh, first open it. Uh, if I use my right hand to drink water right now, then, then this is the, my, my uh, skeletal correlate of water drinking, or the mechanism for, for water drinking. And if you lesion my right hand, that would be kind of cruel. But if you tie up my, my right hand, I can just move it to my left hand, and I'll do the same job. 
so I don't turn blind. You don't necessarily turn blind. You actually, in, in that case, you have to find out the redundant system. You have to identify. So these four CPUs are highly connected. You need to lesion them all. Uh, so that would be a lot to do. And if you do, then people tend not to be testable anymore. Um, I mean, you don't, again, you don't lesion them, but I often say, in, 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 I fail to say in passive voice, uh, if, the, if those areas get for all four areas in your frontal and your parietal counterpart get lesion, it's very difficult to test them. They, they're, they're often in permanent coma. So there is one case of a patient, they said, uh, that has bilateral prefrontal lesion uh, because the, I think it has the tumor and then the doctor ordered to... Uh, it was in the, in the 40s. They just ordered to cut out the whole prefrontal cortex. At some point in psychiatry, we, we know that there was a bad idea that people thought it was a good thing to do. If they to cut off the whole prefrontal cortex might help them to improve with their personality and stuff. In that case, they just took out the prefrontal cortex. They sucked it out. Uh, at least there was a paper. And then they cited this case. They said, OK, so all these like uh, arguments that we, we've been making is like, well, you, yeah, you, you lesion the PFC didn't affect much because the, the lesions were unilateral. So here's a case of bilateral. Uh, lesion, and the paper was old. The paper was from the 40s. So I, as I said, I, I got into interested in the history, and my colleague Bob and I urged me, just let's download this paper and 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 and, and get it. get the paper from the from the library. Actually, we have to re go to the library, request a copy because it's so old, and then get it and Xerox and then stuff. And we read the paper, and the brain looks like this. This is a case of the patient with complete bilateral prefrontal lesion. Here's the brain. So I don't know about you. It looks like. It clearly doesn't seem to add up. This is the right hemisphere. There's a whole brain here. I mean, the whole part brain here. So it's like, what's going on? And then you read the paper more carefully. It's, a bit, it's basically by a sole author. The, the author was a neurologist. And he ordered the surgeon to do the whatever uh, surgery. And back then, there was no MRI. So probably the surgeon just missed. Uh, that's what I thought. And then I, I, I bring this figure up. And people say, no, no, hang on. Maybe this is just a clerical error. You're not being charitable, right? You're interpreting the data kind of harsh. Maybe this is the pre-op image. They just have a clerical error that makes it up. I said, well, hang on. There were 1940s. There were no pre-op images. There were no MRI. This is post-mortem. The person's dead when you look at the brain. And they still have that much prefrontal cortex. Your prefrontal cortex doesn't grow back like that, right? I wish it does. Um, so clearly, something is very wrong about the paper. Um, and so we wrote a piece and pointed out, well, presumably, you didn't read the paper when you cited this as your most critical case. I'm pretty, <coughs> I was pretty damn sure that they just did not download and well, read the paper. They just cited it based on the title uh, or the abstract. And they gave me a reply that was even more interesting, I think. Uh, they said, well, no, 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 hang on. So this is how you think the, the brain is, right? This is a prefrontal cortex you think is there. Actually, it's not quite like that. This is the central sulcus, they say. And so the central sulcus here, so you have a little bit of, you know, sort of premotor area. But most of the prefrontal cortex used to be here is now gone. They actually said that. It was in print, so you can check this out. Uh, it was in, in, the, in the paper. These, these figures were taken from in print. I don't want to comment further. Almost someone was like smirking. You shouldn't mock your colleagues. Uh, this is actually a, a gen. This is actually what happened in a journal called Journal of Neuroscience, which is the flagship journal for Society for Neuroscience. We are disagreeing. Where is the central sulcus, which is the first anatomical landmark you learn in neuropsychology, <laughs> and. I know I'm nobody. I'm just, I just happen to be a full professor who teach these things for a living. Uh, and they are from very senior scholars. And we are disagreeing about these in print. I mean, I just don't, whatever. Like, I think I know what's the true answer. I asked enough neurologist residents double blind and asked them blinded. And so like, tell me which figure is more plausible. I asked enough of them to have convinced myself I think, I think I'm OK. But let's say they are right. Let's say they're right for a moment. Really, we disagree with the central sulcus is in print. That doesn't make the field look very good. And that, that is really where I stand. I, I feel the consciousness as a field is not moving forward at this point because we don't have the infrastructure of the field to move forward. You know, people, when I, when I was a graduate student, again, being young and cocky and, and so, so contentious and everything, uh, my, 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 my doctoral father, Pasim, always told me one thing, you're only as good as your peers. I was like, no, I'm, of course I'm better than my peers. I'm, I'm the 
outstanding <laughs> star student. <laughs> They're better than the peers. No, you're never better than your peers because you, are, you have committed as a scientist to a system that is called peer review. That's all you have, right? I mean, you do your experiments, you think you're right, you have to publish it. Even if you don't, if you publish it somewhere. You have to convince your colleagues that you're right. And if your colleagues collectively as a field does not have a structure to, to examine facts, if, if, if we are in, in, engaged in a business where facts don't really matter, ideas are the most important. We sit in our armchairs and solve the hard problem of consciousness because, you know, pen fuel fail, echoes fail, all these Nobel Prize winners fail, but I'll be the last one. Everyone had this kind of ego attitude to want to be the last one and write off facts, then it would not work. However good your experiment you are, you will not work. You'll be stuck there. Um, so it's a bit personal. Um, and I'm going to show you a bit of evidence just to wrap this part up uh, that, that actually this is a paper from Steve Fleming, my, my good friend, who also studied these uh, things. He has a more constructive uh, personality than, than I have. So he said, like, let's not get too worked up. Let's just do some studies and find some prefrontal patients and show them that actually uh, even in unilateral lesions, so here, here, here the patients are actually not bilateral, it's very hard to find bilateral patients that are testable, actually most of them are very impaired, even just prefrontal. So we find uh, lesions, uh, relatively large lesions in prefrontal cortex and show in these of three groups, so in white is the healthy control, in red would be the uh, anterior prefrontal lesion patients, often mostly unilateral, in blue are the uh, temporal lobe lesions. So we get them to do a perceptual task and a memory task, simple, you know, shapes and stuff, like very boring. Uh, and here, the performance in the perception and the memory task. As you can see, just basically the groups don't really differ. Uh, there is some titration of stimulus that, that by design keep it this way, but, but you can see that basically they don't, they don't really differ uh, very much in performance, at least in the experiment. What they differ was this uh, measure here that I call metacognitive accuracy, which is something that we invented because we really want to quantify how big this effect is. Um, because people keep saying these effects will be small even if we find it. So in the case of memory, what happens is after doing a memory trial, they rated how sure they are they're correct. So, and then you can find a, a, a metric to correlate how, how the, mem the memory confidence with the memory uh, accuracy. So in, in normal, young, healthy adults, the correlation is pretty good, right? So when you say, I, I'm sure I remember your phone number, I tend to actually do. Uh, and, and when I say I probably lost it, and I, then I most likely cannot guess it, right, just by chance. So your confidence actually reflects your, your uh, ability to do the task because you have conscious introspection of the memory experience, right? And, and so in the memory case, you can see there's no difference between the three groups either. What is really different is specific to the perceptual task. So in the perceptual task, when you do a visual detection task or discrimination task here uh, to AFC, and then after you do that, you rate your confidence. For these patients, it's all over the map. They're just like, they, 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 the effect reduced by half. So it's not a small effect. I mean, you have to quantify it in a psychometric scale to, to see how big the effects are. It's not like they have everyday problems. It's a, it's a unilateral lesion. So as I said, I don't expect them to, be, to have the function completely abolished. You took out one of their four CPUs. Uh, but clearly, there is some very selective problem that relates to introspecting upon your perceptual quality. It's not just introspection in general. So I think it's a beautiful study. I'm not on the study, which makes me feel more comfortable to talk about. It's not just like uh, we, we try to make these claims. It's actually known in the literature. Uh, that was 2014. And then this debate happened in 2017 when they already started to write off these things. And the other amazing thing is after write, writing this up, we pointed it out. Uh, and, I, and I actually talked to these people in, pro, in person. What happened was Christoph Koch published another Nature paper repeating the same point uh, this year uh, as if this doesn't exist, the, the debate didn't exist. So we have a kind of shout louder, who can shout louder in more high profile positions uh, kind, of, kind of debate. So that's kind of upsetting. So let's move on. Uh, I don't want to end my talk on this band of telling you all the dirty laundries in our, in our field. So that actually that thing has one silver lining. It really impacted my career in a way that uh, it is still happening and still unfolding. My graduate students are all freaking out a little bit uh, because of how much it, uh, it really it, 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 it kind of 
bother me at almost at a, in a personal level. My, my, my young students would always come and tell me, how about you should, you should not take things so personally and calm down a little bit and stuff. So it's good to have students who are more mature than you are uh, as a person. But it's at the same time, uh, it has a positive impact on me. I, 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 don't, I get a little bit worked up, of course. So it, it is not fun. But at the same time, it got me to really to start to think about clinical applications. I feel there's no way to end this, right? I mean, a lot of basic science debates are the same way. How things really get to the point that people can really say uh, very improbable, crazy things, and yet gain and retain the social trust. I always think about this problem. When I, when I was a, just a child, I remember my, 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 my school teacher told me that dolphins are not fish. I was like really disappointed. <laughs> I thought like dolphins are fish. They swim in the ocean. They look like a fish. Why are they not fish? And they said they're not fish because they, you know, they don't lay eggs. I said, well, laying eggs doesn't seem very important to me. I mean, they swim uh, in the ocean. I mean, they look the shape totally like a fish. And they said, you know, scales and so on. I mean, those are what you think are important. I think the important thing is that they have to swim in the ocean and look like a fish. And they said, like, no, this is not how biologists decided. And I always felt like, this is really a matter of who, you, who decided, but at the same time, I have respect for biologists, right? Because they, they do seem to be doing cool stuff. They are not a bunch of quacks. So, okay, you guys say it's fish. I, I, I grudgingly accept. And as I get to high school, then you get even more crazier stuff. I, I know people who say that they put one thing in two places at the same time. It's like, come on, this is, like, this is just a lie. It cannot be true. And they're quantum physicists. They actually said, like, your CD player works because of our ability to put one thing in two places at the same time. I said, like, yeah, my CD player does work. And then, and, and then meanwhile, they said, well, we also are the same industry of people who put a man on the moon. So we say, we tell you, we put one thing in two places at the same time all the time, tabletop physics. I believe them. I never saw it, but I just believe them. Uh, I think a lot of science is really that. It's like how much you have achieved as a field. Uh, if you achieve enough stuff, then, then the trust would start to build. And, and that's increasingly what I think is important. And again, I don't want to sound patch. I don't know, I don't know the struggles and, and the challenges in your field, but I feel these lessons might be relevant here. If you really want to create a new paradigm or new, something new. So over the discussion in the last few days, we talked a lot about uh, um, effect sizes. And I think these are exactly what matters. It's no good you publish two papers and, and, and then five of your colleagues you know, love it. And you really want to do something that even people outside would have to feel the impact. And say, well, actually, you know, if, you want, if you want to establish that uh, PTSD can be, can be cured in a certain way, you, you need to think about those cultural and social factors. Otherwise, your, your million dollar drug, drug program doesn't work. Uh, those are the things that really we got them. Uh, interested. So I actually started thinking about stuff like that. And around this time, I, um, I, uh, I moved to UCLA from Columbia in 2012. Uh, at Columbia, we don't have a clinical program. So many, many psychology programs don't have a clinical program. Uh, because you know, clinical psychology is just applied, it's not real science. So real, real, I grew up in a tradition where real basic scientists think we're better. But I, but I moved to UCLA where my really wonderful colleagues, they are, they are, they are wonderful clinicians, and I, and I got to appreciate what they do. So one of, one of my uh, colleagues who made a really big impact on my career there is Michelle Krask. So what she does is she uh, take the animal uh, physiology uh, models of rodent learning, and a lot of them is on fear, because I, I think it's easy to do fear conditioning in rodents. Um, and, and turns out it's like decades of, of research, if not a century, of research on, on animal conditioning have given us very, very solid theoretical uh, grounding for, for basically treating phobia and anxiety and PTSD, that sort of stuff. And the idea is just similar to Pavlov's dog. Uh, of course, Pavlov famously rang a bell and, and then paired the bell's uh, ringing sound with, with delivery of food, and then the dog started to salivate, salivate, and afterwards just ring the bell, the dog salivate. And then, you, and then the question is, how do you unlearn that? And you can unlearn that by ringing the bell without giving the food. 
ball many, many times. So you get reassociate, you, you, you get to relearn, okay, now the ball game's changed. Now that this uh, so-called CS plus, the condition stimulus, is no longer associated with this uh, 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 US. And likewise, you can think about uh, uh, if you have spider phobia, it's the same thing, right? You can, uh, you can think of the spider as a CS plus that has been maybe uh, associated with poisoning or something bad in your ancestral history or your, your hard-coded memory. And then how do you get rid of spider phobia? Again, you present a spider over and over uh, without the, 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 the getting, getting poisoned, then you'll be fine. Uh, so you relearn that this stimulus is not actually paired with something so traumatic. Likewise, if you've been cut by a knife, you just have to slowly see a knife and see how the people use knife, exposed to the stimulus, and recondition yourself that there is actually no, no real danger. And it really works, and, and we know the, 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 the basis of this down to molecular uh, single cell level, any, any level of biology that, that you would desire to have. This is a really the most, one of the most grounded uh, therapy that you can do. Uh, the problem, of course, is people are a bit different from rodents, uh, especially not lab rodents. They, they, they have the choices, right? They, they, they are not, you know, held in a cage. So when you tell them this is the therapy, usually they already say, I'm not sure I want to do that. <laughs> I, have, I have spider phobia, and you're basically telling me I'm paying you money to try to get over it by hanging out with spiders. Uh, that isn't very good. Uh, and many of them actually leave. So in the case of uh, phobia, that's actually, I would think, is the primary reason that we're not treating phobia all the time. Usually it's just attrition. They, after a few sessions, they drop out. Uh, for those who actually complete the session, they tend to do fairly well. Um, and in the case of uh, more extreme, like PTSD, uh, especially like war veteran PTSD. I, I heard PTSD talk about several times in this in this meeting. That is the I think is the basic primary reason why they are not getting treated. So we people develop basically they, a, a typical war veteran. I mean there there are different cases of course, but the typical ones that that, that you, you hear about from these clinics is they come in and they said I'm not sleeping well. They don't they don't say they have PTSD. They say I'm not sleeping well. Can you give me sleeping pills? And and then you say well. I think maybe you need to see a, a, psych, a clinical psychologist to go through some exposure therapy. And then quite often they'll say, I don't need a shrink. It's, I don't have a problem here. Uh, I, I'm not mentally damaged or anything. I mean, I came from war. I, I'm, I'm fine. I, I lost two friends, but I'm fine. I just, I just want sleeping pills. They just want a pill. They just don't want to go through the, 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 the treatment. So now, doing something positive, taking what I've learned in the past, like decade and so uh, about what I know about consciousness. I think we can do a thing to help people here. So the idea is um, I know how to, uh, uh, from, from those studies, I know how to read our unconscious signal in the brain out pretty well. Uh, I don't know how, why they're unconscious and why they're some unconscious. I, I have some ideas, but not very clear. But um, I can read them out to the point that I can not just like, read out a signal then show it on a blob on a, on a brain. I can actually read out a fine-grained pattern and I can feed it to a computer algorithm so that I can actually decode the content, so-called, kind of using pattern recognition, a bit like the kind of deep learning AI type of stuff that you guys hear about all the time these now. Um, and I can actually read out the content of, of what, what those uh, uh, pixels means. So it's not just a blob here. I can say, like, well, this blob with this pattern means that you are very likely uh, seeing something like red lines in front of you. And another pattern, I can see, well, this other pattern means that you're seeing green lines in front of you. So red and green lines, if you just present it to the brain, then the visual cortex light up. Traditionally, as of about 10 years ago, most researchers would say, well, the, the activation was similar. But at this point, we can actually reliably tell from, from your brain pattern whether you're seeing green lines or, or red lines. It's, it's a technique called multivoxel pattern analysis. It's just like pattern recognition stuff. So if you do that, then you can do a kind of neurofeedback that I really like. Uh, neurofeedback is just a, 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 a variant of, of biofeedback. You can present uh, stuff from your brain uh, to, to the screen, and then over time, people learn to control it. That's the typical type of neurofeedback. I'm not so fond of that, because I know that brain signals are measured invasively are very poor. So when your signal is poor, you don't have much to control. And quite often, those studies have, have some replication issues. Uh, but here, I'm not, I'm not just feeding back you the brain signal itself. I'm feeding back the decoded brain signal. So I'm not just feeling, this is your brain activity, try to control it. It's very hard to, to do. But here is a fine-grained pattern voxel of activity. And sometimes these decoders can be like 70, 80% correct. 
So that's a pretty decent signal, sometimes 90 even. Um, so you can feed that signal back. And then, so in this study, they, it's actually, uh, this is my study too. Uh, so they started off in Japan with my colleagues, Mitsuo Kawato, and uh, they, they actually started the first paper in 2011. I read it, I was just like blown away. Uh, so, so, so it followed from the original design. They just tell people, like, do something to your brain. They actually said that. <laughs> I think it's the translation. In, Je in Japanese, it may sound less funny. But do something somehow to your brain. Uh, and then after 12 seconds, you get this feedback. It's like a big circle. If it's a big circle, that means that you won 100 yen, so about a dollar. Uh, yeah, hundred about a dollar, uh, but quite is half a dollar or something. You want you win some money per per trial. Um, maybe if you don't pay them that much. Sorry, I think the maximum they can earn is actually ten yen. The maximum they can earn in one trial is just a, a, a tenth of a dollar, just ten cents. Yeah, otherwise they earn too much money. Uh, so usually in the end we try to we try to make sure that they be, they get paid something like thirty forty bucks, but not not much more. We are cheap. Um, so that's right. So every trial, they would just learn to do something to the brain and then get some money. And then, but after like three hours or five hours of doing this in different across different days, then they would say they can they can control this stuff. And then you think, oh, so you must have figured it out, right? So I tell you, like, so tell me what's your strategy? So actually, when the 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 the, the brain scanner was hooked up in such a way that that circle is big. Every time you think of red lines, but not green lines, right? It's specific. Uh, you would think that they would have figured it out, or they might think of figure out something related. They might think oh, every time I see uh, like uh, blood because of red or, or fire engines, then I would then I would get a signal. Turn out they completely have no idea. Uh, they just said I would think about lunch, yeah, over time. I would think about like something completely related. I would think of my favorite food, sushi. Then I then the, then the thing got bigger. Um, they have no idea. And then I think what happens is this is just a feedback loop in itself. They just don't have to do anything. Perhaps they just bring it. The bring pattern happened, and then they get rewarded. And then with the right pattern, they just get rewarded. Turns out that this is a completely pass, almost like a completely passive reinforced procedure, which is nice, which is what we want. Because here, you're effectively getting a way to induce a specific pattern into the, into the brain unconsciously. They don't have to cooperate. If it's a trauma patient, they don't have to think about a trauma, then you will get more reward. Just think about whatever. Uh, just do whatever. Try to earn more money. And then if they earn more money that the right patterns is happening, that means that they're getting exposed to that pattern. And meanwhile, that pattern is getting reinforced as well. So a negative thing is now being associated, instead of something negative, is being associated with a mild uh, monetary reward. So we actually did the study. Uh, we did a study uh, exactly like that. So we first pair. Uh, we first pair the, uh, the, the lines uh, with, the, uh, with a brain pattern. We, we, we learn how to decode these patterns from the brain. And then we pair these stimuli with electric shocks. So the reason is we want to make them frightening to see whether this procedure can erase the fear later. So we pair the, the red pattern with shock, the green pattern with shock, and there's a yellow one that is just control. It doesn't do anything. Um, and then in here is just a kind of like sanity check to show that this is a skin conductance response. Some of you know it is. It's just basically you, when you're when you're afraid, your skin get get you sweat a little, you 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 get scared. So so the conductance goes up. So these are the uh, conductance values for the red guy and for the green guy compared to the baseline. So they become positive effectively. So they they do become more afraid of these two as they should because the shock is not not nice. But then they do this uh, basically four hours of uh, training in the scanner over three days that they, they don't, we didn't tell them nothing about the, the instruction, what they're doing. They said, like, sit in here, look at this gray thing, no color. Uh, do whatever you can to try to make this circle bigger later on. Um, and we just, we, just, we just don't tell them what, what to do. And they were some very, very bewildered. They said, like, okay, whatever. But after uh, an hour or so, they said, oh, this is fun. I'm earning money. Uh, and then what happens is they, if they think about the red thing, is there a green thing? They earn more money. But I want to say they think about they think about it unconsciously. Uh, and then in fact, lo and behold, after a few hours, the skin conductance for the red thing reduced by half. And the of course the idea is that because this thing has been associated with positive reward, now this becomes less frightening and it's specific to this stimulus. It's not just that this training helped them. So that makes me think, well, maybe we can even use it to bypass Amir's kind of problem, this placebo effects, which is a huge problem, right, in the whole industry of clinical psychology. 
In clinical psychology, I mean, in, in, in drug research, you can see people should control for placebo effects. Sometimes they don't because they are, they are sloppy. In clinical psychology, all of these therapies that my, my colleagues do in my department, you, you have a therapist sitting and talking to the, to, the, to the patient or client. How can you double-blind control it? <laughs> You, can, you cannot give people sham therapy. <laughs> you say, train, train some you know, people to learn the reverse of CBT, learn the wrong instructions, or random, randomize the CBT instructions, and get them to give people sham therapies. So that will be single blind. And then the patient and then the therapy provider themselves would not know that they have learned wrong CBT, because that would be double blind. Right? It's like, no, you're just not going to do that. But here, you're basically doing something that is truly blinded. This is just a computer algorithm. Um, so we actually did the next study, which is truly double blind. This is actually single blind because we didn't think of it at that point. Um, but as soon as we tried to replicate and do the second study, we thought it was something even more um, interesting but challenging. If we really want to move it to real, real world, here's the real challenge. So right, right earlier, I told you how you learn these uh, patterns. So how you learn these voxel patterns. These are fine grain patterns that differ from, from brain to brain, depends on the vasculature. So you show these people red lines and green lines, many, many of them, and then you learn these patterns, right? Um, and, and in real life, you might think, okay, if you're afraid of like chainsaws and spiders and needles and stuff, I would just show you, show you many of these pictures and then learn your pattern. But then you're back to square one. It's not going to work because people are afraid of these things. They don't want to see these things, and you, they, they will refuse to be, to be hide in a claustrophobic environment to be seen many, these images many times and have to attend to them. Um, so what we did was something truly crazy, and it's pulled off by a, a fellow crazy Montreal guy called Vincent, uh, or Vincent, uh, Tastro du Montreal. He, he's from here, he's from Laval University. He came to my lab and, be a post, and, and did a postdoc with me. This is a truly, truly insane sci-fi study that I think no one else would have pulled it off because I think most people just would not even try. So all the kudos to, 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 to Vincent for even having the, 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 the scientific courage to, to try. Because in, logically, it can be done. So logically, this is how it can be done. Um, you present people many, many, many images, images from 40 categories. Right? So these are small, but they're snakes, you know, the bugs, the cockroaches. I'm super afraid of them. Uh, bats and uh, other things. Some, some are less frightening, but some 40 type of stuff. And, and you put, uh, in the beginning, we put 50 people to do this. 15 people to do this. And then now, think about who's afraid of snakes? Anyone afraid of snakes? Are you afraid of snakes? Yes, yeah, so you're afraid of snakes, that's good. So you can see all these things without snake, right? Sans snake, because you don't like snakes. But you see all the rest of the 39 of them. And I also see the, the 39 of them. And I can see snake for you, because I'm not afraid of snake. I'm, I'm, I'm Cantonese. We eat snakes. It's not big. So, we, uh, so, so I, I see all, all, all snakes. And now with this, I can then put my brain pattern to yours, we calibrate our patterns so that they are in the same similar space based on the other 33, 39 things. So essentially, I try to re rearrange my voxel so my apple pattern is similar to your apple pattern, my uh, worms pattern is similar to your worms pattern, my cockroach pattern is similar to your cockroach pattern. So I calibrate it as much as we can using those other 39 things. And then from there, I was saying, well, having calibrated now your brain and my brain looks very similar in that space, then my snake pattern would probably project to yours and work quite well. And one, you might think, not work that well. But if I get everyone else here to help you, so you have like many surrogates, they all see snakes for you to decode your snake pattern, then you can do that. In fact, you can, using this method, it sounds crazy, but you can actually then decode someone's snake pattern without that person ever seeing snake for up to like 80% correct. You can actually, just 80% just meaning I show you an image, and then I can just read from your brain pattern whether you are seeing snake or not seeing snake at 80% correct. Not perfect, but pretty good. Um, and then you put it to work. Uh, and in fact, it does work. So here is uh, basically going through this first, because it's similar. This is the skin conductance uh, from the active control uh, to the other control. This time it's computer randomized. So we don't know. Everyone's, people usually are afraid of two things. So we, let's say you're afraid of snakes, and you're also afraid of butterflies. I just made it up. Then I let the computer randomly choose one to target. So you don't know which one it was. Uh, and and it, so the, the one that, that is being, being neurofeedback modulated is the active one. And you can see the SCR went down. Basically, this time the effect was even stronger than the last one. 
uh, and then the, for the control it didn't change. And likewise, your amygdala activity, a, a region that is important for fear and especially conditioned fear, also activity went down. Um, so it worked. So um, I'm going to basically end here uh, and say leave some time for questions. This has been a, a funny reason why I ended up doing this, right? As I told you the story, I wasn't. Many of my clinical colleagues think that it's a, such a good thing that Hakon has finally become the you know, turn from the less indulgent uh, scientist trying to solve this hard problem to become more compassionate and want to help people. I said, like, no, actually, I like helping people. It's fine, but uh, but the motivation is not that. And then some other people think, oh, maybe funding is really hard. People complain about funding, so you want to do these kind of more practical research. I said. Also, yeah, money is also good, but what really drove me was really trying to establish the field and how to gain legitimacy in a field where legit, basically the basic respect from our colleagues has always been an issue, <laughs> where it's very hard to establish who is saying the truth. Thing. It's, it's, it feels a bit like, a, um, more like humanities, a bit like philosophy, where, where things are so subjective. So I come from philosophy, I, I, there's like nothing wrong with that subjective uh, evaluative process, but I feel the science should be more objective. And how do I bring some ground truth? And this is really how I got into this. So I already mentioned that the, the future plan is that, well, basically, if you think about this, this could be further than this. We are not just like treating phobia here. For, right now is phobia. We're having a grant to move into clinical trial to actually test, to use this to treat phobia patient. We're also thinking about like PTSD, the other more extreme man of phobia. But you think about it broadly, this can be the whole of basically clinical psychology, all this cognitive behavioral therapy. Most of them have a structure like this. You try to reassociate one thought with another. You try to uh, reassociate one behavior. You try to discourage or encourage some behavior, except that it's all done in, 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 you know, in, in person. But if you can do this, then you can put it on the brain. So this is a picture uh, of a nature paper from uh, Jack Galant's lab showing that you can actually decode semantic concepts from different voxels of the brain too. So concepts like money, power, motherhood, uh, love, sex, all of these things are, are concepts in your brain. All these, all these, Freud, all these, all these concepts that the Freudians love. Um, and except that now you can finally do a double blind. You can actually, if you think that some concepts activated would help certain specific problems, this time you can do a double blind clinical intro. And, and that, I think, should be exciting. Thank you. I just kind of, I remember from the, from the 90s that um, there was kind of a split where, where the psychologists would focus more on the, the easy problem and then the physicists would work on the hard problem to so Roger Penrose, you know, yeah. had some bizarre theories about, uh, right, like uh, quantum mechanics applying that to understanding consciousness. It, has that been abandoned, like this kind of this really weird theory or are you... Yeah, I think I think I think right. So Penrose hasn't made very far. Uh, so Roger Penrose, a like, highly respected Oxford professor, um, I think I don't actually know the details. But people say like that his working relationship with Stephen Hawkins was Stephen Hawkins needed someone even better than Hawkins himself in math, so he found Penrose as a collaborator. So th these are like seriously uh, influential uh, mathematical physicists, um, and he wrote a couple of books, and that I think most people in psychology and neuroscience didn't like it. And in some ways, I feel there's a parallel here again to to, to these people I, I know and, and, and like. They are also doing it now in a very in a way that is very much physical. I didn't even talk about their theory. Their theory is pretty much like a Penrose-like kind of theory. Just from the armchair, you think of some mathematical axioms and say, oh, this is how it works. And I think that's also why they tend to write off empirical details. It's in, in a way, very much like Penrose. I think Penrose basically was inspired by the Gödel's incompleteness kind of kind of thing. So, so there are some mathematical <laughs> properties that he wants to believe uh, should work in the brain. And then there are mounting evidence that it does not work in a brain like that. All these quantum physics, it does not work like that. And there's mounting evidence that the, 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 from psychology too, that the, the, the brain is not, psychology is not consistent. There's no, there's no need to apply Godolian theorem to it. But he just write off the details in order to let the ideas have their way. So in a sense, that, that thing is still very much alive. But Penrose himself has not made a lot of impact. So, um 
it seems to me that this is not, it's a very important story about the sociology of science, and this is, we, we talked earlier, we have an earlier course in the summer on critical neuroscience, and you, your case study would fit perfectly within that in terms of all the dilemmas about how paradigms are constructed and defended, and, and how there's always surplus meaning in these paradigms that is not necessarily empirically based. And, you know, there's an important process both within science and in terms of social applications of critiquing and understanding what's going on here. And certainly when you claim to tackle consciousness, everybody's attention driven because what could be more important to me as a conscious being than where that's coming from. But it seems to me something else is going on here in your work, which I think is very, very um, positive, which is in the effort to understand mechanism, you're, you're, rather than looking for what's the essence of consciousness and can we localize it in one place, which I think there many philosophical mechanistic reasons for saying there's something really wrong with that way of framing it. Because if consciousness is a process and, and if it, you know, it, it, it emerges out of complex things, it may not be localized in that way. And that's also, I guess, one difference for me because I see Tononi as talking about something that's not localized. It's more about kind of network property of the process. Again, on the face of it, it sounds a little more plausible, but anyway. Yeah. But in the end, what you're doing is you're fractionating things and unpacking them in a way that go into this clinical paradigm. And to me, it's very relevant to a fundamental issue that we have conceptually in clinical care, which is this tension between what people say they're experiencing uh, and what we can measure in various ways. And we've heard this repeatedly over this week, that men tell you, that if you put them in a stressful situation, they tell you, it's not bothering me at all, yet they show this big you know, hormonal or GSR response. And we can already do that with, you know, forget brain injury, we can do that just with GSR and the lab Lazarus did this years ago to show the you know, with and sensitizers and so on. This is very, very important because it's unpacking more complicated process of uh, adapting to an environment, coping with it, managing it in certain ways in which self-awareness and self-reflection is only part of what's going on. So it seems to me by tackling a clinical, a certain sort of clinical problem, you're beginning to unpack that in very, very interesting ways. And it will, I think, I'll be more, you are going to get closer to your goal because you're going to end up not with a monolithic answer that this is the spot and this is the, you know, this is what has to light up, but more like this is the process and this is what has to happen for people to have this kind of experience. Along the way, I think you're, you know, you're, you're providing not only interventions, but a much deeper mechanistic understanding of what happens when people engage with the environment. So a final point about this, you know, you, I, I fascinate because I used to think uh, philosophically, we would never have the kind of mapping that we're starting to have. But my, no my notion was, fine, we, you and I both instantiate snakes in our brain. There's no reason why they have to look anything like each other. They could be, all they have to do is serve that function in our network, and, and they could be totally different, they could be placed in the brain in a different way, there's no reason. It turns out, there is a certain amount of convergence, and you can begin to unpack these things in some ways with these transforms. My question would be, do you think that if we knew the learning histories of people and we knew their cultural backgrounds, and so because here you have a reference where 15 people will amalgamate these and we'll use the other 14 to, to, to guess what his brain is going to look like when he's seeing a snake, so we can already guess pretty well without ever seeing it. Do you think that would, if, if we knew something about people's cultural background, history, and else, we could do a much better job of that uh, because these exposures? Um, are not really isolated objects, they're in a context of certain kinds of experiences. Yeah, I, yeah great question. Um, I think, I, let me address the, the first part after, but, but the, the question first, I think so. Uh, we always suspect it so, but we don't have the data. So the, the studies were, because the, the method of this uh, wonderful decoder neurofeedback method was originally started in Japan, so we've been collaborating with them. And in the end, we flew people over and it's all scanned in Japan. So all of these were based on mostly male Japanese graduate students in, a, in engineering schools. So they are a very, very narrow group of people. Uh, but that's a good thing because then as we now want to take it to the clinic, one of the arguments for getting NIH funding is to say, well, clearly we have, a, we have something to demonstrate that it might have potential, but we need to get a demographically representative population, so can you give us the money to scan in Los Angeles? So they said, okay. <laughs> so, we are, so we are now going to scan people who, who would reflect a fairly diverse, maybe as, as about as diverse as Montreal, uh, this kind of population. We will find out. And I, and I would anticipate from the, from the existing literature that yes and no. Yes, you, you would definitely improve uh, somewhat 
if you take into other, the account of uh, not just ethnic, ethnicity and culture, the shape of the brain is a little bit different across different uh, ethnic groups, uh, and, 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 and the representation will be different too. But the good thing is, uh, the I don't have the evidence at all, but it's to speculate off the cuff. The, for the higher level representations in the prefrontal cortex, if we tap into those, I think they will be very different. They will be very different from people to people, and the culture would be one major, major, and an experience uh, would be one, 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 one major factor to account for the difference. For the early visual cortex, though, it seems to be really quite, quite, quite consistent, and we are tapping into the unconscious representation mostly in the un but we, because of the uh, the robustness of the of the structure in the visual cortex, so it really is a kind of spatial mapping of a spatial configuration. Yeah, you yeah. I'm sure that there, there, in, even there you will find some ethnic and cultural differences too, but I think I'm, I, I anticipate they might be rel relatively small. Yeah. Would that not be a limiting factor for the exponential use of this technique for other psychopathology? Maybe, maybe, yeah. But but it would not be that limiting in the sense that when you do when you do exposure therapy, if I show you the picture of a spider, quite often the experimenter also didn't take into account your cultural background as much. Oh, but that's yeah. exposure therapy for phobia. Yeah. The idea was that you could use this for more than just phobia. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. So when it when it comes to that point, then. Then, then ignoring culture would be a limiting factor, but probably by then we would not ignore culture. Yeah. yeah. Uh, hi, I have a question about PTSD. But, uh, for a long period of time, I think that uh, the theory of mental Im imagery, the mainstream kind of uh, the way to explain the mechanism of uh, trauma. But then I, I always have some problem with it because I think that patients they have. Uh, they, they become different historically. Like, for example, that if you test the it, it, it clearly can explain those people who suffered from short shot in the first period of the uh, World War. It's, pure, it's more like pure form of fear and avoidance. And then entering the Second World War, combat neurosis, and people, people started to explain their trauma differently. And now, in the, in the, in the era of TF75, it seems that the trauma, the presentation of trauma has become more and more moving towards more narrative form. People do come in and say, okay, talk about that PTSD. Right. So I don't know how you come how would you come in with some mental imagery experiments now are still very popular. I think I think you're right. Uh, the awareness of, of PTSD has changed, right? I mean PTSD is a one of the newest form of psychiatric diseases. It doesn't have a history as, as long as uh, at least not documented. Um, uh, in the same way like, like schizophrenia, um, which has remained relatively stable compared to this. And especially in, in PTSD victims and in, in, in female uh, victims that they are, are patients, they, they t there's a cultural factor is huge. There used to be a sense that they, many of them would suppress and not report them. Um, things are getting better, and as these are changing, um, the question is why all these imagery, all these very basic exposure approaches still work. And I think that's a good point that allowed me to get back to, to Lauren's point earlier too. So, so yeah, it is fascinating. All of these um, issues are coming to a head, like just really in the past few years. So this is from Joe Ladue, uh, Ladue and Pine. Um, so Joe Ladue, of course, is one of the people who are uh, 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 sometimes being Sometimes being said that he's responsible for putting amygdala on on the map of fear. He has actually he has a rock band called Amygdaloid, uh, which sings <laughs> and he sings about songs about fear. So he did most of his work about like this amygdala, it's a very simple circuit of of fear. He's a rodent physiologist, a great scientist, uh, but but also he actually had an interest in in consciousness that that people didn't know so much because he did his PhD with uh, Gesanega on split brain patients. So even early on, he started thinking about this. So recently, he started thinking about exactly these issues. You have traditionally a lot of these drugs. The same same in social phobia. A lot of these drugs take animal models like a rodent model, and then in the rodent model, it's easier to study and make. You know, you, you really know the circuit down to like single cell level. Uh, and you know, you know the molecular mechanism for reconsolidation. Amazing, beautiful science being done. And you want to take these to the human. It's a good case, right? Take these to the human case, and those drugs don't work. 
So in Joe's writing, and in, in he, would, he would talk about the fact that you can keep, give people like anti-anxiety drugs like benzos and et cetera, and, 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 and the hens stop sweating. They stop having like butterflies in the stomach when they go to parties. But if you ask them, do you enjoy going to parties, they say no. It feels dreadful. And they just like, but you tell them like, but your, but your body is not freaking out. You used to like shake and, and sweat and they say, yeah, I know, but it still feels stressful. Um, and the idea maybe for, for, for someone like Joe, so, that, so these issues are really coming to the forefront in psychiatry too, I, which I find very, very happy. And Joe has his uh, uh, opponent, uh, who, who is my colleague, Michael Fenslow. And they are people who still defend, no, the, the, the fear circuit model is still right. The amygdala fear circuit is still right. There's, there are people who still defend the, the animal model and say, like, we just haven't fully understood it yet, and that's why it doesn't work. Uh, I think that there's something to it. And, but, but there are also people like Joe who say, no, but this is actually just the wrong circuit. Amygdala is not even about fear. It's not about consciousness at all. Amygdala is just physiological survival response. All the fear experiences come from these higher cognitive areas. Pretty much like the, the hierarchical model I was talking about, um, and and the silver lining. So we will debate that we'll, until we find out we don't know. But the silver lining is probably something usually when you have a debate like this is tend to be something in between the two, right? And in terms of treatment, I think what happens with the same is, is a bit like uh, the case of depression. So think about Steve Holland's work, where where he showed that actually P, uh, SSRIs are not completely useless. Uh, some, some people might be more skeptical than that. I think it's by and large quite bad for you. If you control for placebo effects well enough, the effects are pretty tiny. But I think it's, it's quite still widely accepted that SSRIs are good for when you have very sh uh, sharp onset and, and intense major uh, depression that might be life-threatening. So you take the SSRI, and meanwhile you go and see your CBT. And they would say, well, but why? If you go do CBT, you don't need SSRI, right? Your CBT is what really sustains your long-term um, uh, recovery. But the two are actually complementary. So as you think about this model, too, if, you, if you first shut down the very basic physiological freaking out, and then you go to see your doctors, then your, your, cl your clinical psychologist is going to have a much easier time trying to do uh, image, uh, imagination studies or other forms of studies. Uh, so the, the, to put it that way, I think your question is more subtle. You could think about the exact, just the image exposure or, 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 or mental exposure. How does it work? How, because of the, it seems to be so complex. Yeah, it still works because it probably still deal with this first level stuff. You still get rid of the conditioned fear, which is probably just a small part of it. But getting rid of that first, then going into the deeper part of your mind would become easier from there, probably. So the person who, who, who stopped sweating and shaking hands and, 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 and you know, hands shaking and uh, heart pounding, to convince that person to eventually enjoy a party might be somewhat easier, at least, than, than the person who was still, still hasn't taken those drugs yet. Just a brief comment on that, yeah. because um, you're describing it as a kind of additive model, but maybe there are these two components, and we can work on one, and then we can work on another. Yeah. But there's also evidence that, I, first of all, I agree, and I think there are multiple components, and that's part of why we probably need multiple interventions. But I think that these things also are interactive. interactive yeah. There's an old paper by Malcolm later just on treatment of anxiety and agoraphobia, where it's been giving people anti-anxiety medication actually interferes with cognitive therapy. Because what you're learning is not just to get comfortable in a situation, but how to master your anger. And if you think the mastery of my anger is in the pill, then that's your strategy. And if you think the mastery of uh, the mastery of your anxiety, I should say, anger. Uh, so the, the point being that what's really going on here is that, as it's partly intimated here, but you need another feedback loop coming back. That in everyday functioning, these things are not simply going on in parallel they are sort of constantly interacting with each other. And so, uh, and I'll think that we do those theories, because otherwise we do apply a simplistic attitude model. And then we're puzzled why it's not working, or why that thing that should be OK is actually making things worse, or, or preventing something uh, from going on later in terms of, and even the whole theory of, of what is happening in exposure therapy is not simply that you're, you know, you're uh, reducing the association, let's say, between the theory but if you're actually creating another strategy, another way of perceiving the environment that then can interact with 
that, that um, previous kind of right? Yeah, right on. I, I was I was thinking about something interactive too, but I was thinking mostly in simple, you know, synergistic interaction. So when you have both the physiological problem and the, and the high cognitive level problem, they would just exasperate each other. But I think you raise a good point. They may not. I mean, sometimes if you lose the physiological component too quickly, then the, the cognitive strategies just aren't going to work because some of them are just taught, they, they, they tell you how to master the, the physiology. Now that that is gone. There's nothing to master anymore. You have to master something else. Yeah, that's a very good point. I thought that. How specific do you think that these uh, stimuli have to be? Like, do you think um, eventually, rather than having people, uh, like snakes, for example, they'll be able to move on to things like uh, words and uh, uh, try to have people spend more time thinking about positive words versus negative ones? Like, uh, what kind of uh, abstraction level do you think is going to reach? Yeah, the, we don't have evidence, obviously. We have now two papers. Um, I mean, we've done more papers, more, more on neurofeedback in general, but for treatment-related uh, neurofeedback, we've done two papers so far. Um, so this is something that gives me hope. Uh, I, I would think that the, the working hypothesis is whatever you can really decode from these brain patterns, you should be able to do that. At least there's no reason to, just to, to, to doubt why it would not generalize so far. Um, the issue why we are not doing that yet is really, I think the part of it, the, the, the justification for the studies, uh, that is, is quite expensive. You, you require M fMRI, which is expensive, and we require multiple sessions of fMRI, which is expensive. Uh, the justification is it is expensive, but it is much cheaper than seeing a one-on-one uh, -on -one therapist. Uh, I mean, in some sense, cheaper or comparable because it's now computerized. So we are usually thinking of cases where we really have a justification. So the strongest cases would be like PTSD, where they really refuse to see the therapist. And so going under the conscious hood would have a, would have a clear um, uh, reason. And for other things like these concepts, it's not so clear to me yet why you need that, instead of, instead of asking them to just write an essay about a topic. Um, which usually kind of works. I think unless you want to associate some concept with uh, negative reinforcement, that would be somewhat harder. Yeah, we haven't haven't gone this far yet, but hopeful. Okay, well, thank you very, very much. Thank you.